all of which brings us to the question of whether Bitcoin and Ether are securities. Remember, Bitcoin and Ether are very different now than initial coin offerings. They exist, they're transacted, and they're broadly used. In a recent speech given in June 2018 by Bill Hinman, the director of the Division of Corporation Finance at the SEC, Bill clearly articulated that it's the SEC's position that Bitcoin and Ether are not securities. That's a very important conclusion. And the interesting question is, what's the logical process that leads to that conclusion? Division Director Hinman reasoned as follows. He said that to the best of his understanding, Bitcoin and Ether were sufficiently decentralized that there was no one who played the role of a promoter in the system. No one had sufficient control over the system. Not only was there no promoter, there was also no asymmetry of information. There was no situation where there was someone like a promoter or like an issuer who would know so much more than people transacting the system that it gave rise to the asymmetry that would cause the registration requirement. And in registration, the issuer or the promoter has to disclose the additional information they have so that purchasers are adequately informed with regard to the purchase and sale of the underlying security. So we have a situation where the SEC has taken the position that sufficient decentralization means that there is no promoter, and when there is no promoter, there's no one who's available to file the information you typically need in a registration statement. And that's not troubling because there's no information asymmetry so purchasers of Bitcoin or Ether are all sufficiently on an equal footing that it's not like somebody knows something that needs to be disclosed that the other person doesn't know. Now, it's an interesting process, but it's, subse it's susceptible to challenge for at least three different reasons. First, let's understand that this is a speech. Speeches do not have the force of law, whether they're speeches by presidents or by division directors of the SEC. Decisions as to whether Bitcoin and Ether are or are not securities are, as a practical matter, going to be made by the federal courts if and when the appropriate litigation actually arises. Now, the logic in the speech may be persuasive to the court, or it may not be persuasive, but still, it's just a speech and that logic will probably have to be articulated in a brief filed with the court, but it'll have no precedential effect. Again, unless the SEC takes formal rulemaking action, speeches and other pronouncements by the SEC do not have the force of law. Second, and perhaps most intriguing, Division Director Hinman's analysis depends upon his understanding of the state of facts regarding Bitcoin and Ether as of June 2018. What was his understanding of the state of facts? We don't know. Nothing in the speech has the division director explain what it is about Bitcoin or Ether that leads him to the conclusion that it's sufficiently decentralized. That's quite curious because typically when the SEC adopts a rule or regulation, or when a court issues an opinion, there are findings of fact. The court will say, I find the following facts to be true, and based on those facts, I apply the law and I reach the following conclusion. When the SEC adopts a rule or regulation, it will typically say, we had hearings, we looked at a record, these are the facts that we find, and because of these facts, we're going to adopt the following rule. Well, here we have the conclusion that Bitcoin is decentralized. We have the conclusion that Ether is decentralized. We don't know the facts upon which the division director is relying. That, that creates quite a mystery because there are many people out there that are going to want to build crypto and argue that their crypto is not a security and they're going to want to argue that if Bitcoin is decentralized and if Ether is decentralized, we're also decentralized. But if you don't have the foundational facts supporting that conclusion, how do you make that argument? Other problem with that approach. 
are the facts upon which the division director is relying all of the relevant facts, or are they even accurate? There's no evidence they took evidence from people under oath. Uh, we don't know where those facts come from. Was it that they read a bunch of stuff on the internet and believed everything they read on the internet? Was it something else? And do they know all the relevant facts? For example, there's a site that you can go to that gives you the distribution of hash power uh, on blockchain, on the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. And it turns out that if you have more than 50% of the hash power, you can do something called forking the blockchain, which changes the rules, which in effect gives you a tremendous amount of control. Well, the data show that recently between 52 and 54% of the hash power is controlled by three different groups of Bitcoin miners. And all of these Bitcoin miners are in China. So the ability to fork the blockchain and to control the Bitcoin blockchain effectively exists in three different entities all subject to the same government's control. Now, does that satisfy the definition of decentralization? I don't know. Did Hinman know that those were the facts? I don't know. We don't have any finding of facts, which makes this a very, very difficult situation for other people attempting to look at this as precedent and comply with the law. Third area that's problematic, the actual articulation of the law. There's no precedent of which I'm aware that looks at decentralization as the primary factor in determining whether an instrument is a security or not. And I could actually take the Hinman speech and argue it doesn't go far enough or argue that it goes far too far. The argument that it doesn't go far enough is simple. Many courts are taking a textualist approach to the interpretation of the law. If we look at the law from a textualist perspective and we look at the phrase investment contract, the word contract jumps out at you. There's got to be a contract in order for there to be an investment contract. The orange is not a contract. The orange is not a security. The combination of the management contract with the land sales contract, that's a security. Well, if you look at Bitcoin, there's no contract. It's like the orange. If you look at Ether, there's no contract. It's like the orange. Bitcoin and Ether, from that perspective, aren't securities because they're sufficiently decentralized. They're not securities because they aren't investment contracts because there aren't any contracts. And by that logic, if that's right, and we don't know that it is, then many other forms of crypto will be able to argue, we're not contracts either, and if we're not contracts, we can't be investment contracts, and therefore we're not securities. So there's a path that we can follow that argues that Bitcoin and Ether aren't securities for reasons that many other forms of crypto can also use to argue they're not securities. Now, I can also make an argument that cuts in totally the opposite direction and that says that Hinman is entirely wrong and that Bitcoin and Ether clearly are securities. Why? Let's go back and let's take the traditionalist approach. We have an investment of money. There is commonality. True, there's no vertical commonality, but the courts say that vertical commonality isn't necessary. True. Every case of which I'm aware involves a promoter or issuer, but that's only because the state of technology that's existed until now. Until the invention of the blockchain, you couldn't have anything that would satisfy all of the Howey elements unless there was a promoter. But none of the cases say there must be a promoter even though there always is a promoter. It's like the story about the black swan. All right, for a long time, people believed all swans were white. Why? Because we'd only seen white swans. Finally, we go, to, we, we go to Australia, and in Australia, what do we discover? Black swans. So the precedent we have to this point is all dealing with white swans. There isn't a single case of which I'm aware that says if there's no promoter, then you don't have commonality. So we have investment of money, arguably in a common enterprise, an expectation of profit, look, let's face it, Bitcoin today is very, very rarely used for transactional purposes. 
Bitcoin is most commonly bought and sold on the expectation of profit, okay? And you've got the expectation of profit primarily from the effort of others. Who are the others? The miners, all right? When you're buying Bitcoin, you're sitting there passively and you're hoping that the value of your Bitcoin is going to increase over time. And from that perspective, it's very different from the orange. It's very different from a block of gold. And it's different in the following sense. When you have an orange and you expect that that orange is gonna increase in value, you don't have to do anything. You just sit there and you wait for the price of the orange to go up. In order for your Bitcoin to increase in value, the miners have to keep replicating that blockchain. Work has to be done. Huge amounts of electricity have to be consumed. People are spending tens of millions of dollars designing ASICs chips in order to be able to maintain this infrastructure. It's not like a bar of gold that sits there and its price goes up and down. It's not like an orange that sits there and its price goes up and down. So I can take the Hinman speech and I can say, what do we do with this? First, it's just a speech. Second, it relies on a set of facts. I don't know what those facts are. And third, it comes up with a new articulation of law. I can argue it's terrific. And then I can argue, well, you know, it's good as far as it goes, but it really should go much farther. And many more things are not securities than Hinman says. Or I can go in the opposite direction, saying it misses the point altogether. And Bitcoin and Ether, they really are securities because you don't need to have a promoter and horizontal commonality is sufficient. In other words, the confusion continues and good faith efforts by the SEC, I think, to clarify a piece of the puzzle have inadvertently made the puzzle a little bit more complicated for us all.